Welcome to Now in the 90s, where we look at the game releases of 30 years ago today. This week, the action RPG for the SNES, an iconic adventure game, and welcome to the real world. Hi, I'm your host, Jared, and today is October 6th, 1993. This video is sponsored by Raycon. Use the link in the description below and use the code BIRTHDAY to get 20 to 40% off everything on the site. Raycon makes high quality earbuds to use for your everyday life. And six years ago, Raycon was born. Yup, it's Raycon's sixth anniversary and they've since expanded their product line with Raycon Home and Raycon PowerTech. So now they've got things like cables, water purifiers, and more. As a thank you for six years of being in the business, Raycon is giving 20% off everything on their entire site, with some items being up to 40% off. I personally have and use their Raycon Everyday Earbuds and use them frequently since I got them a few years ago. They have eight hours of playtime and they come with their own charge case to provide up to 32 hours of battery life. And they sound fantastic with excellent bass and noise isolation for a focus on sound quality. They already cost half the price of other premium brands. They're perfect for listening to podcasts or music while you're in your game room, sorting through the boxes of retro 90s games that need to be alphabetized yet. In fact, Editor Dylan, hit me with a game soundtrack to listen to right now. Ooh, ooh, yeah. Yeah, good choice. Go to buyraycon.com slash in the 90s or use the link in the description below and use the code BIRTHDAY to get 20 to 40% off everything on the site. And once again, thank you to Raycon for sponsoring this video. Software support directly from the studios. Hardware made by third-party developers for third-party developers. Graphics beyond your imagination. They weren't just good, the graphics were real. Released on October 4th, 1993, was the 3DO Interactive Multiplayer. If you're not playing on a 3DO system... What are you playing with? Presenting 3DO. The most advanced home gaming system in the universe. It's time to put away your toys. 3DO from Panasonic, Gold Star, and Creative Labs. A new low price and free games. The 3DO is a disc-based console gaming machine. For the first time ever, it's a gaming console with the sole purpose of giving you the best kind of gaming graphics you could ask for, full motion video. Go beyond the child's play of Nintendo or Sega because this is a real gaming machine for the real gamer. And there's plenty of educational things for families looking to make sure their kids can also learn. The 3DO was created by the company 3DO, which was created by Electronic Arts president Trip Hawkins. The idea was to create a console that was top of the line and catered to the developer, as he would know the frustrations of being a third-party developer. The console was unveiled at a private media showcase on May 13th, 1993. The hardware specs had all the fanciest words in it. A built-in double-speed CD-ROM drive, digital signal processor for sound, a 32-bit CPU, two megabytes of RAM. It could display 16 million colors through 50 million pixels, polygons, texture mapping, it plays CDs, Cinepak-based movie CDs, and even reads Kodak photo CDs. This thing was practically a computer that you hooked up to your TV. Journalists on hand at the event described the machine as revolutionary. Early prototypes of games on display included high value properties of 1993. Games like Star Trek The Next Generation, Jurassic Park, Demolition Man, and had movies on display like Jaws. They described the flight sim Total Eclipse as, quote, putting Star Fox to shame. Early versions of all the games were called, quote, beyond the next level, taking an intentional dig at Sega, and, quote, light years ahead of what they've seen of Nintendo's upcoming 32-bit CD-based machine. Do you have any idea how fast you were going? <laughs> the passive type probably plays Nintendo. Do you have any idea how fast you were going? You tell me. You're the guy with the radar. The aggressive type probably plays Sega. Do you have any idea how fast you were going? I don't know. The little needle stops moving at 100. And the other type definitely plays 3DO, the most advanced home gaming system in the universe. 3 deal from Panasonic Gold Star and Creative Labs. Now $3.99 plus free games. They were convinced that a whole new chapter of gaming would be ushered in with a 3DO's launch later in the fall. So long as you could afford one. The 3DO had a staggeringly high price point. It launched asking for $699 US dollars. For comparison, around this time, the Super NES was selling for 
$99. So why'd it cost so much? Well, aside from all that technology jam-packed into a little box, one of the goals of the 3DO company was to give more royalties of game sales back to the publishers. They only took a cut of $3 per game sold, significantly less than Sega or Nintendo. But to make up for that, rather than sell their hardware at a loss like Sega or Nintendo, they charged $700. As Trip Hawkins would describe, the 3DO wasn't so much a machine as it was a concept. A high-powered machine, low royalties for publishers, full motion video games galore, and plenty of edutainment games for families, and most importantly, the 3DO company didn't even make the machine. Rather, they had the blueprints and specs for the machine that they licensed out to other manufacturers to actually create the hardware. This is why there are numerous designs of the 3DO, all from different companies. The Panasonic FZ1 3DO was the launch model, a slimmer Panasonic 3DO remodel a year later, a 3DO made by Gold Star, and even more models for different markets and reissues. At no point was there a 3DO made by 3DO. When it came to its release day, units were barely available. Most stores only got one or two. It took a month just to sell 30,000 3DOs. But hey, it was worth every penny of that $700 price point to play its launch games. Sorry, I misspoke. Launch game. The 3DO had exactly one game at its launch, aptly titled Crash and Burn. It was a vehicle combat game made by Crystal Dynamics, which got middling reviews. They liked the graphics, but found that the cars couldn't even get into crashes, and worse yet, there was no multiplayer, one of the touted features of the 3DO. See, the 3DO was advertising of potentially having limitless multiplayer capability. The console itself only had one controller port. That's because you would connect one controller into another controller's control port, and then another one, and then you can daisy chain controllers to have four or more multiplayer games. Fun fact, it also just uses the exact same controller ports as the Sega Genesis, so you can always just pop one of those guys right in there. And then when you're playing multiplayer games and you're losing, you just yank them all away. The 3DO would get a lot of ports that were available on other CD-based platforms, things like Night Trap, D, and Madden NFL, all of which looked better than what was seen on things like the Sega CD. Now, to be fair, the 3DO was home to some truly excellent games. It has the best version of Road Rash, the most arcade accurate port of Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, and it was the birthplace for the Need for Speed series of games. It also had Gex, who was meant to be the mascot for the 3DO. The console never really took off. People didn't see a reason to buy it when it just didn't have any software support right at launch. It was getting to the point where outlets were recommending gamers to get the two putt-putt games available for the 3DO just to have something to play. And it was hard for consumers to get excited about it when everyone knew that both Sega and Nintendo had new CD-based hardware coming soon, so why bother with an overpriced stopgap? And it didn't help that it was launched just ahead of the highly anticipated, highly coveted new console, the Atari Jaguar CD. And also in like a year, the PlayStation. Maybe there is something else distracting people from wanting the 3DO. Oh right, I can think of something. Released one day before the 3DO on October 3rd, 1993 for the Super Nintendo was Secret of Mana. peaceful land, paradise is threatened by an unspeakable evil, and only one person has found the power to restore perfect order. In a new action-adventure game for your Super NES comes an exciting tale, The Secret of Mana, from Square, maker of the world's greatest video games. Secret of Mana is an action RPG. Play as the hero Randy as he discovers the Sword of Mana and joins up with friends Prish and the sprite Popoy as they travel the world to restore the balance of magic and life itself. Swing one of eight different weapons and Zelda-like action, each weapon freely interchangeable, and all learn special charge attacks. Pause the action with the intuitive ring system, allowing you to easily use items and cast magic spells. Go to town to talk to NPCs for information, purchase equipment, and earn experience points to level up. Defeat massive bosses, fly on the back of a dragon and do it all in glorious three-player co-op. Secret of Mana was developed and published by Squaresoft. It's actually the second game in the Mana series, with the first one released on Game Boy. In the United States, though, the game was rebranded to 
Final Fantasy Adventure. At different points in time, Mana was going to be Final Fantasy IV before it got changed to a secret project titled Chrono Trigger, before finally becoming Secret of Mana. It was originally intended to be made for the upcoming Super Nintendo PlayStation, a CD add-on for the 16-bit console. After Nintendo scrapped that project though, Secret of Mana had to be reworked and crammed onto a cartridge. This resulted in a lot of cut content, removed dialogue, and a lot of storyline changes. It also removed multiple endings, and on top of all of that, when it came to the English release, Squaresoft translator Ted Woolsey was given only 30 days to translate the entire game. With the time constraint and the constraint of the text box itself, Woolsey had to cut out a lot of dialogue to quote their bare essentials. This may also explain why the way every single person talks in the game is kind of a jerk. Early previews of Secret of Mana were first shown as early as March of 1993, where the game was branded as Final Fantasy Adventure 2. It was already impressing media outlets with its vibrant graphics and fantastic music tracks. It was highly anticipated purely as being a new RPG game from Squaresoft and the fact that it was going to be on a whopping 16 meg cartridge. That's a huge video game. Of course, the coolest thing that Secret of Mana did was be a multiplayer co-op RPG. Anyone could easily press the start button and join in on the fun. And thanks to the recently introduced multi-tap, courtesy of Super Bomberman, you can have three players all at the same time. I knew a lot of kids back in the day who got the multi-tap, not for Bomberman, but for Mana. There wasn't as much of an advertising push for Secret of Mana like Square did with their other games, like Final Fantasy Mystic Quest. It got a handful of preview articles, and it was the cover story for Nintendo Power Issue 54 with a 10-page preview. But besides from that, no other magazine ads. It was mostly word of mouth that made Mana as popular as it is today. This was in no doubt thanks to the multiplayer gameplay and all of the glowing reviews. GamePro Magazine loved it and would go on to call it the best RPG of 1993. Electronic Gaming Monthly also gave it high scores and awarded the Game of the Month with the Editor's Choice Gold Award. Shockingly, it was Nintendo Power that gave it the lowest rating, with an average of an only a 3.6 out of 5. It went great. Secret of Mana would go on to sell 1.8 million units and is now considered one of the staples of the Super Nintendo library. It would get a direct sequel, but that wouldn't see an official release in the West until 2019 with the collection of Mana on Nintendo Switch. Secret of Mana is also on that, and it was also included in the miniature Super NES Classic console. It also got a full remake in 2018 for the PlayStation 4 and PlayStation Vita, and you know what? I didn't really like it all that much. The original is the way to go. I know we already talked about the 3DO for this week, but why not talk about the other weird CD console already out? Released this week in October 1993 was the seventh guest for the CDI. The seventh guest is a point and click adventure game, but spooky. Explore the mansion and solve all kinds of puzzles to figure out the mystery of the manor. All kinds of spooky ghosts haunt the halls and it's up to you to figure out why. Discover the deep dark secret of the manor and figure out exactly who is the seventh guest. The seventh guest first hit the market for home computers in April of 1993. The CDI version was the only home console version of the game. This was kind of a big deal for the time for two reasons. Not a whole lot of people had CD-ROM drives for their computers yet, as most games could still be installed by floppy disks. The other reason was that the CDI didn't get a whole lot of video games, as it was mostly home to things like interactive encyclopedias. It being on the CDI was seen as a big get, since the game still looked great and played very smoothly for console port. The FMV sequences still looked just as good. And really, it was the abundance of live action actors on top of in-game sets that made the game so appealing at the time. It had so much FMV that the game required two discs, which was seen as awesome. As a young kid, all of the live action ghosts made it extra scary for me and I was terrified to play it. Along with that, spooky skeleton hand for your mouse cursor. The seventh guest at the time was seen as a landmark title pushing forward gaming. It released right around the same time as the original Myst with very similar gameplay. The combination of the two basically helped sell CD-ROM drives, but CDI owners getting to play it right away was a big win. It was heavily pushed as being one of the scariest games you could play. It had stomach-turning graphics, the creepiest sound effects, and atmosphere claimed as disturbingly real. Of course, if you look at it now, 
The live action is hilariously cheesy and the whole thing makes you giggle. The home port was seen with good reviews. GamePro gave it near perfect scores, calling it a new standard in digitized computer rendered games. They said, quote, CDI owners locked out. The seventh guest went on to be a certified hit, mostly on PC, but still. It was enough for it to get a direct sequel with The 11th Hour. If you wanted to play The 7th Guest now, I mean, it's not the CDI version, but it is available on Steam, and sometime soon, they're gonna release a VR version. Also coming at you for everything else this week in terrifyingly realistic 50 million colors, here's Editor Dylan. First the 3DO, then the CDI. What's one more console that barely anyone owned? The Turbo CD got Dungeon Explorer 2 this week. I'm not much of a dungeon crawler fan, which is why I'm pleasantly surprised that this one went the gauntlet route. Top-down action where you shoot arrows, knives, swords, or spells at hundreds of constantly spawning enemies. It has some well-done animations with CD quality sound. It's got stat progression and a pretty sizable campaign with a full-blown story. And yeah, three players for Secret of Mana is really cute and all, but this game has not three, not four, but five player co-op. At least that's what everyone says. I couldn't find a single video of more than two players, but I choose to believe it's possible. If only I had that many friends to play it with me. I'm kidding, of course. I don't have time for friends, I got deadlines. And while we're comparing things to Square's SNES RPG of the Month, let's look at Enix's SNES RPG of the Month, Paladin's Quest. First off, I'm confused. What the hell does Quest mean? If only they called it Paladin's Warrior, then I would have known what I'm in for. Might as well call it Saken den Stankenstein, or however you say it. Second, poor Enix. This game didn't stand a chance against Saken den Sexy Time, but from what little I played, I think it holds up pretty well. It's a bit lighter in tone, but the visuals have a unique pastel theme with bold black outlines, and the story is basically Harry Potter in 1993. At least in the beginning it felt like that. Which also has an awesome first boss fight that I won't spoil because I'm too busy losing money in Super Caesar's Palace for the SNES. This is one of the more basic gambling games on the console. You hit the ATM, scratch some cards, get stopped by police for being a high roller, lose everything to a bunch of spinning pictures, get pestered by another cop who tries to guilt trip me into gambling more money? Like fuck off dude, you know I'm broke. Stop trying to nickel and dime me. Wait, do I know you? You look familiar. I swear, you look just like... No, can't be. Hang on, let me call someone real quick. Alright, it's ringing. Is that Tommy? I knew it! I knew it! Oh, he's picking up. Tomothy Talladega Nights. How the hell are you, man? Oh, really? Well, that's unfortunate. When did... Uh-huh. Oh, that... Uh, yeah, sorry about that, man. Like, I didn't know it was you in the police outfit and... Well, I was a little heated, and to be fair, you were being kind of a dick at the casino. I mean, Tom, Tommy, let me finish. Tom, Tommy, you stopped me and... Tommy, listen to me. I'm not yelling. I'm raising my voice because you keep interrupting me. Okay, now I'm yelling. Why do you always do this, dude? Every fucking time. Of course I'm not stalling to think of a good segue for Kendo Rage for the SNES is basically Super Valus meets Sailor Moon, a side-scroller where a magical girl transforms into a Kendo master. The cool thing about this game is that the anime aesthetic is front and center. In the 90s, Westerners would go to great lengths to remove any iota of anime in their games, which explains this box art. I touch on this when I talk about street combat back in our April 28th, 1993 episode, but the localizers of Kendo Rage embrace its anime roots, and as a result, it keeps all the charm. People might roll their eyes at the overused anime tropes and cliches on display here, but back then, this was still somewhat rare to see on the Super Nintendo. What wasn't a rare sight on the SNES were Lemmings-style games like Troddlers. And while I don't usually care for Lemmings games, I will admit this one puts a unique spin on getting all the little guys home. Remember Fire and Ice from our March 17th episode? Of course you do, you watch all our episodes. That's why you don't leave comments complaining how I rush through world heroes, right? But in that puzzle game, you play as a wizard who materializes or magics away blocks. Troddlers takes this concept to help guide the critters all over the place. It works well and even implements the SNES mouse, just like Utopia from last week. Our final release is another Lemming-style game called Lemmings, which is like Lemmings. 
just like the last three times I covered it on the show. Nine games came out on these four consoles this week in 1993. I know we said there was only one console launch game for the 3DO, but there are so many sources claiming the 3DO version of Lemmings released this month, next month, next year, and even last month before the console even came out. What? How does that make sense? One of them has to be wrong, and if evidence points towards a definitive date and it's not October, just blame me. I'm the one who put it here because I thought the new 3DO graph on the left looked a little barren. Wait, that is okay to do, right, Jared? Yeah, I can roll with that. Ballin'. I love this show. Later, y'all. Thank you, Dylan. Like we mentioned, the 3DO had a retail price of $700. These days, you can get one for anywhere from $80 to $200, depending on the model. If you're looking for Crash and Burn, you can get a complete copy for just under 30 bucks. Secret of Mana sold a lot, but as a coveted SNES RPG, it's maintained some value. It released costing $72.99, and now a loose copy is worth $50. A complete box one is a little harder to put together with the box, manual, and the included map to bring it up to $175. The CDI version of The Seventh Guest isn't too bad. It released with a suggested price of $59.99, and now it's about $20 for the discs themselves and $45 for a complete one. And that's it for today. Next week, Contracted Dinosaurs, a live action western and my boy. I'm your host, Jared, and this was now in the 90s. Thank you so much for watching Now in the 90s. I want to thank some patrons this week like Kenneth D, Taggy, and Sonic would beat Mario. Please like the video and leave a comment down below, especially if you played any of the games this week, and subscribe if you haven't already. And if you already are a subscriber, thank you so much for watching this show every single Friday. I actually remember the very first time I got to see and play Secret of Mana. I forgot what grade I was in, but I went over to my friend Tim's house because he had this really cool game to show me, and it was Secret of Mana. And I was super honored when I found that he renamed the sprite to Jared so that I could play as myself in the game.